Hello, I'm Amy Sheely. I'm one of the genetic counselors at the main campus of the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm here to talk to you today about Alzheimer's disease and APOE genetic testing, what you should know. I'd first like to start with an overview on dementia. Dementia involves change of our cognitive functions. Cognitive functions are more than sometimes we think they are. They include our use of language. Are we using the right word at the right time? Our ability to multitask and to think critically. Uh, our ability to problem solve and decision make, as well as our memory and our personality. As we get older, all of us have changes to our cognition, and a lot of times that is typically normal. We call it senior moments or, you know, walking into a room when we forget where our keys are. And that can be, like I said, perfectly normal. Where we get into concern is when people are diagnosed with something called MCI or something called dementia. MCI stands for mild cognitive impairment. And this is trouble with some area of cognition or multiple areas of cognition that is measurable to physicians and to medical professionals but it doesn't substantially interfere with your daily life. Dementia, however, is a more severe version of cognitive problems that includes troubles that are severe enough to significantly interfere with daily life. For example, forgetting family members, remembering how to get from point A to point B. Sometimes people can be diagnosed with MCI and they never go on to, in, to progress into dementia. Other times people do develop dementia over the course of months or years. Dementia is a blanket statement for people that have changes to their cognition. The overall chance for us to get dementia during our lifetime is somewhere between 10 and 12%. The older we are, the higher the chance for us to develop this dementia. It is a di disorder of aging. Somewhere between 24 and 45% of people, for example, over age 85, have this diagnosis. There are many, many different causes of dementia. Not all are genetic. People can have vascular dementia due to changes in small blood vessels not allowing oxygen to flow through the brain very well. There are conditions called frontotemporal dementias where you will see memory loss and, for example, significant behavioral changes and difficulties. And then, of course, there's Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia. However, like we said in the previous slide, not all dementias are Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease, though, is the most common form of dementia. It is progressive, meaning that it will get worse over time. It involves memory loss, personality changes, and behavioral changes as well. In addition, people will begin to have trouble using language appropriately. The course of the disease often is around eight to 10 years, but this can range very significantly and can be very different among family members. When physicians and medical professionals are talking about Alzheimer's disease, we tend to try to categorize it or classify it in different ways. And there's a couple main ways that people do this. The first is how many people in the family actually have Alzheimer's disease. So this is sporadic versus familial. Three quarters of Alzheimer's cases are sporadic, meaning that only one person in the family has the, has the diagnosis. Sporadic Alzheimer's often occurs at older ages. And by older ages, we mean people who develop symptoms over 60 or 65. It is not strongly genetic, but it has what we call a genetic component to it. It has multifactorial inheritance, and this means basically what it sounds like. Multifactorial inheritance means that there are multiple factors that go into somebody's risk for Alzheimer's. So this could be several genes that are weaker genes that do not cause disease on their own, but in combination with each other or in combination with environmental risk factors stack up into a certain point if somebody reaches a threshold or a tipping point, so to speak, they end up developing the disorder. And if somebody has Alzheimer's disease in your family and it's a first degree relative, meaning a parent or a sibling has Alzheimer's, the chance that that first degree relative, the chance that you would get Alzheimer's is around 20 to 25%. However, if more than one person has Alzheimer's disease, so two or more individuals in the same family, 
We call that simply familial Alzheimer's. Again, this is only a quarter of all cases, so it's much less common than the sporadic form. Most familial cases also occur at older ages, although we can see younger ages of onset, like we'll talk about in a minute. Multiple genes are involved with this as well. We don't know all of the genes that are involved yet, but we do know some of them. And in some cases, first degree relatives can have up to a 50-50 chance to develop Alzheimer's disease themselves. Alzheimer's disease can also be broken down into age of onset categories. So late onset is defined as symptoms starting after 60 or 65. Again, it's relatively common in the general population and it's not often strongly hereditary. One gene is not powerful enough to cause late onset Alzheimer's disease in a very large majority of cases. APOE that we'll be talking about in a few minutes is one of the genes that we know can predispose people or make it more likely for people to in develop late onset Alzheimer's. But there are many other genes that are also known to be risk factors. Early onset Alzheimer's disease is very different. In early onset Alzheimer's, symptoms start before 60 or 65, and many times are starting in your 40s or 50s. In early onset cases, you are more likely to see multiple generations of people with the same disorder. We know of three genes that can cause early onset Alzheimer's disease, and there are likely more. These three genes are more powerful than the late onset genetic risk factors like APOE. These early onset genes are powerful enough on their own to cause symptoms if they are not working properly in almost everybody who has the change in one of those three genes. APOE is typically not involved in causing early onset Alzheimer's, although some evidence state that APOE may influence the exact age that people develop symptoms. So now I'd like to switch gears and talk specifically about APOE as a risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's. APOE is a gene. We all have two copies of this gene. We inherit one from our mother and one from our father. And if you remember from school, genes are like chapters of instructions that tell our bodies how to grow and how to function. So we all have APOE in two copies, and in most people, both copies are working okay. There are three forms or types of this gene that you will sometimes hear or read about being called alleles. APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. These alleles are like saying somebody can have red hair, uh, blonde hair, or dark hair. So just three different forms of that gene. So all of us have some combination of these alleles, depending on what we inherit from our parents. And you can see some of us are 2-2, two, 2-3, two, two, so, and so on, 3-4, four, 4-4. Four, four. APOE, as we mentioned earlier, is a risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's disease. Specifically, it's APOE4, that version of, or that allele of that gene that increases somebody's chance to develop Alzheimer's. The higher the number of copies of APOE4 you have, the higher the chance that somebody will be, develop Alzheimer's. However, APOE, even APOE4, is not powerful enough on its own to cause Alzheimer's. Almost half of people with Alzheimer's disease, for example, do not have even one copy of that APOE4 allele. And at least half of people with two APOE4 versions of that gene never go on to get Alzheimer's disease. So at best, it's a risk factor, but it's not something that can give you a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, tell you you're going to get it for sure, and if you don't have APOE4s, it's not a guarantee that you will not get Alzheimer's. But what are the chances? If somebody has one copy of APOE4, sometimes you'll hear that called heterozygous, so heterozygous for an APOE4. If somebody's heterozygous for APOE4, their chance to develop Alzheimer's over their lifetime is about 20 to 25%. And you flip that around and that means 75 to 80% of people with one copy will never develop the disease. And also, if you remember, if you have a first degree relative, so a parent or a sibling with Alzheimer's, just having that family history is enough to increase your chance to develop the disease to 20 to 25%. So it's relatively similar to somebody who has one copy of APOE4. 
people with two copies of ApoE4 are homozygous. Their chance to develop Alzheimer's is higher at about 30 to 55 percent. That said, 45 to 70 percent will never develop Alzheimer's disease. When people are thinking about doing ApoE testing, we want people to think hard about how this will impact their lives. So when we think about this, people want to think about how will I use this information? Will it be helpful to me to know if my chance is 20%, 10%, 50%? What will I do differently? Will this change anything for me? Would I be more likely to travel more if I knew that APOE was four was in my future? Would I not? Uh, would my physicians do anything differently for me? In a lot of cases, the answer is no, because we don't know enough to know about who will develop it if they have APOE4 and who will not. So many times it's just information and information only. Some people worry about implications for insurance if they are found to have this APOE4 risk factor. We know that we have good protections for most individuals through a law called GINA. It stands for Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. GINA helps protect most people from employment and health insurance discrimination based on a genetic risk factor or based on a family history of a genetic disorder. These are people that do not have symptoms themselves. And these are people that, you know, we potentially could be charged more for group health insurance than other people on the same plan. So GINA helps protect people from having that happen to them. That said, we do not have good protection for life insurance, long-term care, or disability insurances. So if people with APOE4 are found out by an insurance company, there's always a possibility of not being able to get life insurance, long-term care, or disability insurance based on genetic testing results. We also want people to think about implications for family members. Maybe you have a sibling and your sibling has said, I don't want any information whatsoever about whether or not I'm going to develop Alzheimer's disease, but you do. And if you find out you have APOE4, E4, so homozygous, and we know that your chance to develop Alzheimer's is up to 55%, there is a chance that your sibling would have that same risk. So considerations about who do I tell that I'm doing this testing, if anybody, and how much information do people want to know are all things that people should think about before deciding whether or not to proceed with testing. And then again, the emotional implications of this. Some people say, the more information, the better. I'm okay with knowing my chance is 55%. Other people say, I can't do anything differently, or I know that I, there's nothing I can do to absolutely prevent Alzheimer's disease. I already know my chance is 20, 25% because I might have a family history of it. So is it really different for me to know that I'm at a 20% versus a 50% chance? My last piece of information is, should I see a genetic counselor? So as we've talked, you might have realized that you've developed many questions about the implications of genetic testing for yourself and your family. If this is the case, a genetic counselor is always happy to walk through this with you in more detail. Some families have multiple generations of people with Alzheimer's disease, so maybe a parent, a grandparent, several relatives, or maybe people with onset of Alzheimer's at much younger ages, again, under 60 to 65. In those cases, APOE testing may not give you a lot of useful information specific to your family. You could, for example, have APOE2, E2, and as far as that gene goes, have a lower chance to develop Alzheimer's. But if we are not testing for the right gene, you could still have a 50% chance of developing Alzheimer's, even though you have APOE2, E2. So in other words, APOE doesn't fit all family situations. Thank you for your attention to this video. It was a pleasure to speak to you today. And if you have any questions, please reach out to your providers and they will guide you to appropriate resources. Thank you and have a good day.